All right, welcome back, everybody. My name is Christiane Koch. I'm from the University of Kassel in Germany, and it's a great pleasure for me to introduce our next speaker, who is uh, Dwayne Miller, who has uh, just been lured over to Germany from uh -huh. the University of Toronto, where he was before. And uh, Dwayne is one of the uh, leading experimentalists in the field of coherent control. Now, coherent control means using quantum mechanics to control things. And um, about a few years ago, I took my little niece uh, to a lab that is similar to Dwayne's. And uh, she got showed around by one of the students. And I asked her at the end of the day, well, what did you learn? What do these people do? And she said, well, they're tickling molecules. And that's real fun. <laughs> so, so Dwayne, please tell us more about how to tickle molecules. Thanks. Thanks very much. So um, <clears throat> great. Thanks for seeing so, so let, let me say what a, a pleasure it is for, for me to be here because I met I, we went out for dinner I went out for dinner with a few teachers last night and had a great time and boy you guys are a great group <laughs> right and so when you get older and you want you know you want to find your youth again and that right? so there's this Ponce de Leon who looked for the fountain of youth you guys are it <laughs> so, uh, when you sort of think about where the next generation of scientists are coming you are the amplifiers that get the message out and get the kids turned on so yeah, I could just give you one quick tidbit on, on sort of my involvement with this or, and why I'm committed to try to help get you to the front lines of science. We did an analysis of, of our best students at the University of Toronto and they don't come randomly. They came from a few schools and we, were, we could identify them to a few teachers. So you really have a big role. In fact, a very small fraction of individuals make an enormous contribution to society and you are them. So you are the fountain of youth. So I congratulate you. <laughs> So I want to. Uh, so what I want to do is, is in, 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 to reciprocate for the great benefits I've enjoyed throughout my career, uh, and a physics teacher who I didn't like and didn't take physics from. So I'm actually teaching physics probably because of that. Um, I want to get you. I want to get you to the front lines. So I'm, I'm going to give you some insight into how science is done. It's not all cut and dry, and I'm going to try to give you a little sociology of the scientific process in the in the, in the process. I'm going to tell you a story about basic science, and it's going to be science that uses quantum mechanics in an interesting way to investigate the linkage between quantum world and the macro world, and it's going to affect your life. It's actually going to change your life, right? And I'll explain to you the applications that are forthcoming that we could have never have guessed. And the other thing I want to get across is I remember as an assistant professor, sometime when I was about 40, bemoaning the fact that I missed the quantum era. Like, you know, oh, that would have been so amazing. I would talk to my students, oh, I wish I could have met Schrodinger and so on. True, all great. But what I want to tell you is this is a new era of science that's just coming up. And for the people who are chemists and biologists, this is going to be Haiti days for us, right? Because the world is not this. It's not eigenstates and, and these stationary states and quantum mechanics that you tr teach at some, some level that was coming from the 1920s. The world's alive. And we know there's this fundamental connection between the quantum world and the macro world at some deep level. And what is it? And so the chemists and biology are now going to see, and this is going to be the message. How many, chemi how many chemistry high school teachers are here who teach chemistry? How many biology teachers? OK, this is for you. <laughs> OK, so this is something that's not talked about a lot. And, and, I, and for the people who teach physics, I'll try to make a bridge, right? There's something magical about chemistry, and people miss this. When you think about the number of possible configurations you can rearrange atoms to go from one molecule to another, it's literally astronomical. Yet, chemistry is a transferable concept. A chemist can take a blocking group, put in a molecule, block on any molecule, take it off, and build all kinds of crazy molecules. How is, could chemistry be transferable? If you put something on, you change it irreversibly in a way but it always behaves the same. There's, the magic of chemistry and biology is that given the enormous number of possible degrees of freedom, it reduces down to just a two or three. There's an amazing, amazing reduction in dimensionality that makes chemistry a transferable concept. And it's chemistry that drives biology, which effectively is life. And I'm going to show you a movie today, <clears throat> and you have to promise that, you, that you, I didn't show it to you. It's under embargo, so you're going to be the first. <laughs> You're going to be the first people to see this movie. Um, <laughs> so, uh, and it'll show you uh, the first atomic glimpses of how this reduction dimensionality occurs. Okay, so now let me get into the, the talk. 
<clears throat> and I'm just going to talk to my time runs out. <laughs> and I'll show you the movie. So, so making them like your movie, this is a, a, a phrase used a lot. It's been described to discuss structures that people take, sort of snapshots on microsecond and millisecond time scales. And they say, oh, we've made a molecular movie, right? And I know in high school, a lot of times you, people teach that you can't even see atoms. But in fact, for over 50 years now with X-ray diffraction, we can get atomic structure, right? And so what people have been getting are snapshots. And I would call that time-lapse photography, right? Making a molecular movie, when I use that expression, which I've tried to define for the field, what I mean by that expression is you literally have sufficient spatial and temporal resolution to really do that great chemist Gedunken experiment, literally see atoms move in real time, right? And so we're starting to see tickling molecules, how they like to tickle each other, right? And so this uh, making them like your movie business, um, I would say, is one of the sort of great, you know, great dream experiments in science. And why would I say that? So, so let's just, for the sake of discussion, just, just imagine you're a chemist, and I'm from that tribe, although I do a lot of physics, maybe teach physics. Um, so imagine you could watch two atoms, and you watch them fluctuate. And just imagine you could witness the two atoms moving along a coordinate, and you could witness the moment the bond breaks and the two atoms keep going. At that moment, you have witnessed the death of a molecule and reincarnation of two new molecules. For me, this would be fantastic. If you're a biologist, Matt, you constantly are trained to think about how do ligands sneak, how does, how does oxygen, a diatom, the smallest biological probe, the itty bittiest smallest thing, how does it get into hemoglobin? It's not even supposed to be able to get in there. And so you try to think about pathways, how atoms move to let it in, right? And in physics, people are constantly thinking about things that are longer range, more correlated type motions of atoms, which are called phonons. So at any moment, I explain those three examples. If you pictured balls and springs moving, you just did that classic thought experiment, albeit you did it in your mind's eye. <clears throat> and for the longest time, people thought this would be an experiment you could never do. And Eigen in his Nobel Prize address stated essentially that, that these time scales and spatial scales were inaccessible, and we'd always be resorting to indirect methods, which he had developed. right? But I can tell you right now, I'm going to show you um, that we can now do this, right? So I want to give you a little insight in the scientific process. It's all, all hypothesis objective and do the experiment and where you go. So, so I, we discovered something in the lab that was driving me nuts. <clears throat> and I was uh, with my daughter, it was one at the time, and apparently it was my turn to take care of her. And I was up all night <clears throat> and in a sleep deprived state. And I convinced myself that we could really crack this problem and we would have to see all the atoms to actually see how it worked. And I'll explain how this is. And so I remember coming to my lab <laughs> in a frenzy, having an emergency group meeting. And, and I'll, I'll give you, so we, I brought up my group to you. I said, you know, I've got it. This is what we're going to do. So we, we, so the, so we to, to help you think about the experimental challenge, that group meeting was basically the following. We want us, we need, we absolutely cannot crack this problem without seeing atoms and all the correlations, right? So we, what we have to do is we're going to have to build a molecular movie camera, right? So now use that as a, as a starting point and think about in the construct, what would you need to make a molecular movie, <clears throat> okay? So the first thing to consider in our discussions was, well, what's the shutter, what the, what's the shutter speed we need, right? OK, so now for those of you who teach chemistry, let's just think about this problem, right? So if you think about two atoms, we're going to take the simplest reaction. What's the time scale it takes for a bond to break, right? So under linear response, if you take your favorite potential, you tell the kids, you know, it's kind of a horseshoe type thing. They're all about the same. You take, if you take two atoms moving at the speed of sound and it moves one additional bond length, the potential is no longer bound within KT and it keeps going, right? So how fast is that, right? So to keep the math simple, let's imagine I have an equilibrium bond length of one angstrom, 10 to the minus 8 centimeters. And the two atoms are whizzing about at the speed of sound of things like you and me, right? So 10 to the minus 8 centimeters divided by 10 to the fifth centimeter per second, the speed of sound, you get 10 to the minus 13 seconds, one ten millionth of a millionth of a second. And chemists knew this is the time scale. So if you teach chemistry and you look at the Arrhenius expression, the prefactor A is 10 to the 13. That's the physics of where that number is coming, right? So the shutter speed you need, canonical shutter speed you need, is 
100 femtoseconds, 10 to the minus 13 seconds. Really, really fast. But what I want to tell you is you literally can go to a store and buy a laser that will get you down to 10 to the minus 15 seconds. So the time scale, it seems so incredibly fast, that is not the issue. And this is what our group meeting was about. The real issue, as all great directors know, to make a good movie, a great movie, you have to catch the actors in the right lighting, right? And the, and the actors, the actors in our movie are the atoms, right? And now you use Raleigh's criteria. You have to have a wavelength that's on the same on the same length scale as the object you're trying to resolve, or shorter. So your angstroms, right? Well, you got a tough job because that means your lighting source, whatever you're going to use, has to have wavelengths in the hard X-ray range, or you use electrons. Now, I'm going to use a joke. I can only use this. This is the last time I'll use this joke. But so I'm from Canada, right? And the edict of Canada in the importance of science is we believe in the importance of science so much that we're willing to put thousands and thousands of dollars into it. <laughs> right? OK. We're not going to do x-rays. Those are expensive. All right? So we had a tougher job than the average physicist. We had to do with this elect with electrons. Now imagine the challenge. Everybody here knows if I have electrons, I need a very bright flash to catch the atoms. You sort of think about taking a, catching them frozen with a flash. Electrons inherently undergo electron electron repulsion. How in the world are we going to get enough electrons in a short flash to be able to capture the atomic motions? Right? So what I want to show you is the first camera to pull this off is shown right here. This is our third generation electron gun in the parlance of the field. To give you some scale, it's roughly the size of a soccer ball or a football for the, for the Europeans. And the way this experiment works, I'm, now I'll, in, I'll explain it to you and then give you the moment. Um, the sample sits right here. And we bring a laser pulse in and excite the sample because our actors are lazy. right? So if I want to take a, just to give you why you have to do this, if I want to see lightning, I know, OK, not in California, but if I go to Toronto, I know I can put, put my camera anywhere and at some time there will be a lightning bolt. I just don't know when. And the same thing with chemistry. These are rare events. How do you catch them? right? So what you do is you bring a laser pulse in, femtosecond laser pulse in. You tickle. Actually, we torture them. You know, we <laughs> so we tickle them. We poke them in to, to play out their scene. And they, we poke them to do it over and over again. And then what we do is we bring a perfectly timed UV, femtosecond UV pulse hit a photocathode, and from the Einstein photoelectric effect, we generate an electron bunch, exact replica. And that electron bunch is accelerated, and it flies to the sample. And, it's ex and I have to say, the physics is exactly the same as the old, an photocathode, the old CRT uh, television sets. Right? This is a TV. There's no, it's no more complicated than the old-fashioned TVs. Right? So we have a very short bunch of electrons that come hit the sample, and you see a splash. And uh, you know, I have to say, this is one of the most beautiful manifestations of quantum mechanics there is. This fact that you see this ring-like pattern, it's because electrons inherently have wave properties. And so I remember as an undergraduate, I struggled with particle wave duality. I could do the math, but physically, it seemed like an abstract concept. When you do this experiment, and you see that splash, it's just you know, good for the soul. right? And then, then you have to imagine, you're looking, the, the electrons come here and they hit a phosphor, and you literally see this by eye. Okay? So now I want to sort of you know, bring you to my laboratory. It's now just slightly over 10 years when we did this very first experiment. So imagine it's now 2 in the morning, which is when these things typically happen. And you're looking at these ripples, and you know, I don't have enough cups or things, but you know, for example, if I brought waves in and hit these cups, you'd have crests that would form, right? And so of all random orientations of, of the crystals, but there's a mathematical relation that gives you a, a corresponding relationship to the atomic positions. Now, imagine you're watching this, and you're looking, and you're starting to see those ripples move. If you could do a sign transform in your head, you were literally watching atoms move in real time. And that's what we saw, and we looked at the clock, which is simply the time, as we heard in the previous talk, you can control the path lengths of light very precisely. We can measure time to 10 to the minus 18 seconds, so this is not a problem. You, you look at our clock, and you go, 
it was 100 femtoseconds and we were seeing those waves move. So this was the very first movie of atomic motions. This was the most exciting moment in my life. Well, I have to be careful. I'm married, I have three kids, <laughs> right? All important. Um, but this was really a highlight and it still gives me a bit of glow. Now, I, I have to tell you, we started this quest, the group meeting I referred you to was 1989. My daughter's now 24 years old. Our first publication didn't come out until 2003. It took 14 years to get this first grainy movie that I'll show you, right? And so a lot of you are probably wondering, I know my, my colleagues like, how did you keep your funding for 14 years? <laughs> and I can explain to people who really want to know. Um, so, so I had to move to Toronto, for example. I used to be at the University of Rochester. I had to move. So my wife has been deeply <laughs> falling. So wait a minute, we want to make a movie and we have to move? Yes, we have to go, we have to. <laughs> so um, anyway, so this has been a very long research campaign. There are many dead soldiers along the way. <laughs> These are the people who survived the march, right? <laughs> and so uh, they've done quite well. The people who didn't, um, now what did I do with that corner? Here it is. The people who didn't um, <laughs> survive the march went to places like Yale as professors, so they did okay. Um, and all these gentlemen here have done uh, quite well. They're also in, in very high, high, high profile positions. These are the current cast of characters. I'll give you a bit of story of what they've done. But my, my point of, because I know you don't know these people, but the point is, this is not a solo effort. So this involved a lot of people, people who I have great respect and, 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 and you know, feel humble in their presence working with them, have come together to, to bring the story I'm, I'm going to give you. And um, I want to know Carol Morrison's group in Edinburgh, for example, and Klaus Floatman and Daisy. This, these are particle physicists, high energy particle physicists working with, with my group, right? And then there's a wonderful collaboration. So this is the movie you can't tell anybody about. Anybody about. This um, was through a really great collaboration with uh, not just one group, but about five groups in Japan. And that was to make the movie film, okay? So this is the story. Now the first thing I want to show you <clears throat> is I want to get across this notion of time-lapse photography and the importance of seeing all the correlations. So imagine you're an anthropologist. I took anthropology too. So imagine you're an anthropologist and you're trying to understand how the Inuit people can survive in these inhospitable climates in the north for eight months, right? And you have two snapshots, right? So this is Nanook here. This is from this famous movie of Robert Flaherty from 1921 which was the first documentary of an indigenous people before Western civilization um, destroyed them. Uh, so this is a captured very, if you I really, if you haven't seen this movie, it's one of the 10 movies I, I really think you should see, right? So let's imagine we have two snapshots here and you see the Nanook, a kayak, and you're trying to understand the structure function relationship of this kayak, which is their lifeline, and here's the Nook with his dog Comstock. So take a look. Come up with a model. What do you think transpired between those two time points? Just imagine what might have happened. <clears throat> okay, time's up. You have to publish. <laughs> okay, so let me show you what actually happened, and you're going to be surprised. And this is going to be an underlying theme when we have. When you think you understand something and then you have a new method of seeing things at higher and higher resolution, the veil gets really removed from your eyes and, and there's always surprises. And this is really, every time we do an experiment with this level of acuity, we see a, a major surprise. So I can, could not load embed this, it's just too big. So here you go. So here's the look coming in. And you have to realize, first of all, um, you see that's not a dog. I 
not swim. You fall in that water, you're dead. There's a baby. The one I saw grandma jumps up, the one that she chewed the leather. So there you go. So, so you didn't expect that, huh? Also, also here's the surprise. You learned, if you think about this for a little while, you learned something phenomenal about the Inuit people. They literally staged that for us, right? They have an amazing sense of humor. Right? And you think about it, if you don't have a sense of humor to survive in the north and you dwell on things that didn't go well, you know, get over it. <laughs> so, so the Inuit people have a phenomenal sociological mechanism to constantly keep going. And that's something you learn by s visiting with them and seeing all the details, all the correlations. Okay, so here's my special part of the universe where I spend a lot of time thinking is to try to inspire you. So what I'm drawing for you, I'm capturing a special moment in space and time that happens in each and every one of you as I'm speaking, hopefully. Um, and so you see, what I've done is I've modeled the heavy atoms in a heme protein as these star-like objects. And this giant red here is supposed to uh, be iron. And what you see sneaking out of the picture here is diatomic oxygen that binds to here. And what I've captured in this special moment, space-time moment, is this mythical region called the transition state where this bond breaks of the oxygen, right? And I'm depicting that as being released as a supernova-like event that stored chemical potential, right? And as opposed to the big universe, in the little universe in each and every one of you, that explosion actually causes this entire night sky to rotate to do, bi to do work on the surroundings, to be part of a living system. You look at it from this perspective, the wonder comes back. You, you get, you know, a little bit, I don't know, chastis, uh, take things for granted on this. And so this is really remarkable from this perspective. And you sort of think about it, this is quantum. So when that bond is breaking, that's a purely quantum mechanical effect, right? This energy has to partition onto the mesoscale, which gets you to the continuum limit of quantum mechanics, right? One of the hardest problems in physics is how do you connect a quantum object to a classical bath? This is the boundary between the quantum world and our world. This is the doorway, right? And so Mother Nature really understands quantum mechanics. She's had billions of years to work on it. And she really understands the correspondence principle. And she's coupled the two in a way that we're just starting to get a twinkling of, of what, inkling of what's going on. OK, so let me show you, how do we understand this? So I usually spend too much time on this, this slide, um, but I think it's important. So, so what I just showed you is uh, one protein of this larger protein called hemoglobin. Hemoglobin, for those who are not biologists, are four proteins that are held together that bind four oxygen. And somewhere, sometime between one or two oxygen off, this molecule decides everybody of the pool and it undergoes a 15 degree rotation and a six angstrom translation, which changes the barrier to binding or the efficacy of binding of oxygen. And it basically tells the molecule everybody out of the pool, right? And I know the biology teachers, because I, I was taught this, that you teach <laughs> that this molecule is really important for transporting oxygen, makes it really fast. But it's not actually what it does. So what it does, it holds on to oxygen like crazy and it increases the diffusion length. So, have, but you have to be able to release oxygen for a system undergoing differential metabolism, otherwise you just simply can't be as big as we are. So clams are itty bitty guys. They only have a cooperativity involving two switches, right? This was an incredible evolutionary advance in the bio world, right? And in fact, if this could self-replicate, it would satisfy two of the three criteria for being a living system on its own, right? So the scaling relationship that occurs between this and the next scale 
that breathes life into matter, right? So, how do we understand this as physicists? <clears throat> we take this really complicated object and we do the spherical cow thing. <laughs> we break into smaller bits, which is my globin, which is the protein, which is in your muscle, right? And then we zoom in at the binding side of the oxygen, which is shown here. And this is, I know it's a little bit hard to see, but this should now look familiar to you. This is this. I just put some nice colors on it, right? Okay, so now for those of you who aren't chemists or just to remind the chemists and biologists in the audience, something about transition state theory, right? So I wanna revisit some history to a, a beautiful thought experiment from the 1920s by Michael Polanyi. And John Polanyi is our resident Nobel Prize winner in Toronto. And it's his father who's probably one of the great minds in both philosophy and science. And he had uh, Henry Eyring as a student and they were just wondering about the magic of chemistry. How, does molecule, how do molecules interconvert from one form to another? It's a bit mystifying, right? Now they didn't do the thought experiment like this, but I'm gonna walk you through it in, in a way I like to get across the challenge. And when you think about it from a biological perspective, it's even harder to understand. So imagine the problem you're trying to, to understand is, imagine you're trying to convert my left hand into my right hand. Well, it just doesn't go, right? So now think about it, how am I going to get this structure to change into this, right? Well, you'd have to break my fingers, right? That's gonna hurt. <laughs> so that's energy, you have to put energy in, so that's be some energy in, you break the fingers, and then at some point, this critical point, it's this kid's game, you know, you point to a finger, you can't tell whether it's your left finger or your right finger. So in quantum mechanics, that is a degeneracy, a saddle point, and then a small fluctuation, kicks you over and you've interconverted between the left and right hand, right? And it's the number of degrees of freedom in the process that are mystifying, right? Okay, so if we look with just this molecular nanook of the north, right? So this is two static snapshots that almost all of chemistry is hinged on in terms of understanding how this simplest model of biology works. So if you use traditional transition state thinking and you look at the structure, and I have to use my hands here because you can't, the figures is a little bit ratty. So my hand is the heme plane, the iron is my knuckle here, and here's oxygen. So the picture when you look at that, the red and the light, what it looks like from, this is Max Prout's Nobel Prize work, when the bond breaks, it looks like it's just motion along the heme normal. So it's just what's called doming. The, the bond breaks, the electron goes in the d orbital of the iron, the iron gets bigger, and it pops out of plane, right? And there's this whole fantastic story that cascades from that, right? And so in terms of transition state, and you need to know these structures to control chemistry, because you want to control that, the, the forces required for that, you absolutely must have information on what the structure is at that saddle point if you want to direct chemistry the way you will, right? So if you think that's the right picture, I'm gonna tell you you're dead wrong. And I'm gonna show you, I, I save no expense to, 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 to educate you on this problem. So if you think about motion on the heme normal, it would look like it's just orthogonal, right? So this is the problem, and this is a, a kind of where you fool yourself and you don't have enough details. So if I take and apply uniaxial force to this cup, you see you get off-diagonal couplings, right? So that's Poisson's ratio in finite mechanics, but you don't have boundary conditions. And so what we showed back in 2003, and this, is, this was part of, when I told you I had this problem I could not understand, we started getting our first results that showed that this old thinking wasn't working, right? And so rather than being localized forces, and every biologist thinks about this reaction coordinate as being localized, people try to do site-directed mutagenesis, and, and it just doesn't seem to work. Well, I'll tell you why it doesn't work, right? Because what happens, in order for that iron to get out of plane, these heavy atoms have to move to let it out. And so the forces, nature picks rings everywhere for a reason. It translates, it transduces the energy over a different length scale, and it maps beautifully onto this helix, right? And so when you think about all the possible ways, I'm going to sp I don't want to spend too much time on this, but we, there's a, a problem called Leventhal's paradox and how biological molecules get to the right structure. But it's even worse, it's even more of a conundrum when you try to understand how they actually function, right? So my group, when we, we did some experiments which proved what we call the collective mode coupling idea, the trick in nature is that these degrees of freedom are not uncorrelated. 
There's a real reason these structures, if you look in nature, you see helices everywhere, and these are like rigid objects. And then you have loops, which have larger RMS motions than liquids. If you try to imagine how that fluctuates, there'll be long range correlations. The system does not try all possible different configurations. It's strongly correlated and it directs traffic through that saddle point. It knows where it wants to go. And it took a billion years to optimize it. Now for the chemists in the audience, uh, when we get to university level, we start teaching them reaction diagrams, right? So you have two atoms, that's easy, one degree of freedom. Two, now you have two dimensions, three, you have three. You know, this has 10,000 degrees of freedom, right? So this would be a 10,000 dimensional surface. No way, it somehow collapses onto a few. And this is the movie I wanna show you at the end, right? So where, where this is going and where it's gonna affect people's lives, and I'm gonna actually give you some really concrete examples is mother nature, nature has optimized what is an inherently highly dimensional problem and found tricks to correlate and reduce dimensions to get things to go the way she wants to go, right? So there's a kind of topology waiting to be discovered similar to the periodic table. Sorry, there's a kind of periodic table waiting to be discovered, but it'll be in topology to understand biology. And this is, this is the secret chemists need to jump to the next scale. We're stuck. We can make big molecules. It's very hard to go to mesoscale scaffolding. This is, this is the big deal. So chemistry is right at the precipice of artificial life, right? So things like molecular motors are coming, but we just don't know how. And so this is going to be the link. <clears throat> and you can kind of imagine new drugs that'll be discovered and so on. So these are the big promises for this field that's just coming up. Okay, so my problem, just like the canoe problem is, I want to understand the structure function correlation of biological systems. There is no experiment that gives you the information. You have to do the hard work. We have to be able to see all the atoms. Which, what's the atom-atom pair correlation? Does this atom and this atom and this atom move together relative to this? If you see all the atoms, you can project out those correlations and you can start to understand why that structure is the way it is to direct traffic. And I have to say, when I give this talk, I used to bring a hologram so you could actually see the atoms in 3D. If you actually look at the structure in 3D with no bias, you cannot figure out how this thing works, right? In fact, we shouldn't even be able to get oxygen in here. Okay, so now I'm gonna give you a progress report, something that started in 1989. I originally thought I was gonna die before we solve this problem. I think I'm gonna live. <laughs> We're getting dangerously close to getting this. Okay, so there's another kind of camera that's been developed to do these kind of experiments. And these are called uh, X-ray free electron lasers. These are fourth generation light sources. So this is Stanford's machine. It's a three kilometer long machine. And it tries to do this with X-rays rather than electrons as I showed you. But their camera is three kilometers long. I'm now in Hamburg. I, I have labs right over here. And they're building a tunnel that's going to go way out into this other township. Aren't they going to be surprised? <laughs> <laughs> and there's one in Japan. There's one being built in, in, in Korea, uh, in Switzerland, and they're, you know, and I have to tell you these, <laughs> so the time resolution is 200 femtoseconds to take these kind of movies and they were built for doing just what I described. Um, and these are the ones that are popping up. Now they're called X-ray free electron lasers, but um, they ain't free. <laughs> these are billion dollar facilities. And so, you know, in a way we, we came online, we got our first movie about eight years before this machine came online. And I'm actually gonna show you, I, I, there's, they're complementary tools, so I'm not gonna say you shouldn't do this. But, and it, I, you know, science is competitive. We're gonna give them a run for their money and I'm gonna show you the best movie that's ever been captured today. Okay, so um, the challenges for electron sources, I, I see I'm running out of time, so I'm just gonna tell you that people thought you just simply couldn't do it with electrons. So I went to a lot of workshops and these points were all brought up. Through these experiments, you have to excite about 10% of the atoms. If you excite a system with the laser or poke, so strongly you change the system. You don't get two kicks at the can. And that means if the problem wasn't hard enough, you now, it was pretty obvious you needed to develop sources that could catch on the right time scale, but you had to get all the atoms in one shot. It wasn't like you could kind of average a few times. You had to get full structural details. So this was really tough, right? And I would say, you know, we were told we'll never be able to get the electrons we need. We'll never be able to synchronize. We'll never be able to characterize the electron pulses, our shutter speed, and we'll never ever be able to do organic molecules and never be able to do solutions, 
right? So I can tell you in the last five years we've done all of these. Okay, so the epiphany moment, I want to give you a, a little bit more insight, and then if it turns out, how much time do I have left? Ten minutes? Okay, I usually do this. Um, so I have to tell you, I moved to Toronto. I had a startup package, and we built a machine, and uh, Jason Dwyer and, and Brad Civic you know, were really excited, and for three years, they built the laser, <clears throat> they built the electron gun that I showed you, and they built a zero jitter street camera, which itself, if you could buy, you could buy it would cost over $200,000. They built all that, and for one year they tried to measure things over and over again, and it just wasn't working. And Brad Civic came into my office in one of the darkest moments of my career, and he said, this bleep bleep experiment will never bleep bleep work. <laughs> right? And he was really upset. <laughs> right? And I'm blah. And so he showed me in the back of an envelope how the theory we used to design the electron gun could not get the asymptotic limit correct and that he had no faith in it, right? And then he asked me the question I think all frustrated experimentalists ask themselves, <laughs> could he do theory? <laughs> so I said, yes, yeah, so, you know, okay, what can you say? So, but this is instructive. So the way the experiment works, the laser pulse comes in, it hits a photocathode, and um, it generates an electron cloud bunch right here, and this is at minus 30 kV, 30,000 volts here, and this is at ground. It gets accelerated, and then goes through mean free flight, a lens, and then your sample sits right here. So the de Broglie wavelength after 30 kV is about 0 0.06 angstroms, right? They're 10 microns apart, the particles. And so within the wavelength, the distance relationship, you can treat this problem classically. Quantum mechanics turns on when the de Broglie wavelength is comparable to the atomic spacing, and then you see this beautiful quantum splash, right? But so what he did, so he gave a group meeting. I'm just showing you four frames to give you an idea how we solved this problem. So what he did, he, he took something from astronomy, the Barnes-Hutt code, and he took 10,000 electrons and he solved the equation of motions for all 10,000 electrons and he gave this group meeting, I'm just showing you four frames, and he said, see, I told you, I was right, this is never going to work, <laughs> right? And so I was very depressed because if you look at what the problem is, here's your electron bunch and the electrons are moving along like so and the ones at the front see a whole bunch of charge behind them and they get accelerated and the ones at the back see a whole bunch in front of them and they get decelerated and you see this charge blow up, right? And so it looked like it was impossible. Our gun was 20, as long as my arm, and this calculation showed that we had to have an electron gun at 100 kV that was only two centimeters, otherwise we had no chance, right? I was totally depressed. Now I didn't go and jump off a bridge, <laughs> although I really felt bad, because uh, I burned up all my money. I mean, we had no startup package left. There was no money left to do these experiments. But the, the answer to the solution is, is staring you in the face. There are two solutions, we use both. One solution, if electrons spread with distance, don't let them travel very far. Duh, right? But you had to know how far could you get away with it. And the second solution is, you notice how this, there's correlations. The front electrons stay at the front. The back electrons stay at the back, right? And they form a beautiful chirp. And so there are tricks you can do to temporarily refocus and you're not losing spatial time correlations. Right? And so that's the key. People miss that, and that's unique to non-relativistic electrons. Okay, so now I've got to speed up. That's how we solve the problem. The history of this is people tried to use just one electron at a time, low electrons, to avoid this Coulomb repulsion. That means you have to hit the sample 10 to the 6 times. Nothing can do that. So nobody could, so Ahmed Zewell, Nobel Prize winner and, and for a different problem, Gerard Moreau tried using low electron numbers, really haven't cracked this picosecond boundary. Our first work right here cracked it with a high brightness source. And I'll show you the progress. We're now within about two years, we're going to be on to 10 femtoseconds. It almost looks like a straight line. So right when I retire in Germany, as a joke, we'll be at zero femtoseconds. <laughs> There's a joke I can explain to you about that. But <laughs> so here's the first movie. And that's, I'll just show you this, and then I'll cut to the, to the last movie, because I won't show you the rest. I think, it, I think it's a little bit too, too academic anyway. So here's the first movie that was recorded with atomic resolution. So whenever you have new technology, you always try to do the simplest experiment, right? So you can imagine my group and I sitting with some beer saying, you know, what should we hit with? Let's hit something real hard and make it melt. Well, <laughs> that's basically what we did. <laughs> but there was a controversy in the literature at the time, and I want to give you another thought experiment from the 1930s. There was a big debate between Max Born and Gopert Meyer on what the bound state of matter was under extreme conditions in stars and in centers of planets, right? And so the discussion goes something like this. So uh, imagine, okay, that's a little bit, I have to be over here, sorry. 
So imagine I have a block of ice sitting here, and you've got nothing better to do because you're a physical chemist like me, and you, and you just sit and watch it melt, right? <laughs> right? So you all know it's going, this ice block's going to melt from the outside in, right? That's called heterogeneous nucleation. Big word, but it's melting from the outside in. The other thing you all know is if I have a blowtorch and I direct it towards that ice, by golly, it's going to melt faster, right? So it's not, those are two data points. That's all you need to understand this thought experiment. So the question raised, and this is something that only a theoretician can do, what if I had a special kind of blowtorch that I could hit this thing, hit this thing so hard that no matter what theory you use to calculate the phase front velocity, you would predict this system should melt faster than the atoms could move. Now that's interesting, right? This predates plasma physics. What, when you have these kinds of extreme heating and pressures, what is the bound state of matter? This is the experiment we did. We had a special blowtorch. <clears throat> we had a femtosecond laser system. And we hit aluminum, polycrystalline aluminum. And there are four grainy pictures, like early days of, of film to show you. And the answer is right there. And you don't need a high, high level of analysis to understand it. So at 500 femtoseconds after we excite the sample, you see these rings. This is because I still have a lattice. The atoms are nicely in certain periodic array. And the light's coming in and scattering, giving this nice higher high order diffraction of correlations. So I have atoms that are related in specific points, right? So that already answered a big controversy in the literature. <clears throat> 1.5 picoseconds later, you see how the rings have dimmed? What's happening, I excited the electrons with the light. The energy's going into their atomic motions. They're moving faster. And so, you know, think about it. These are moving like this. So now we don't have such nice regular arrays. This is called the Debye-Waller effect. You get less phase in interference less diffraction. And so this dimming, from the dimming, I can tell you exactly what the lattice temperature is. Right? It's, it's really hot. <laughs> now the magic is right here. 2.5 picoseconds to 3.5 picoseconds. You see it collapsed into a shell-like structure of a liquid. If there were sound effects for this movie, you would hear something like a demonic wind whipping up these atomic branches. And at some critical moment, the wind would have been so strong it was snapped all the atomic branches. The entire forest collapsed to some disordered heat. That's what happened. The amazing thing is it happened in one picosecond. Had this melted from the outside in, the normal way, it couldn't happen faster than 10 picoseconds. This was an order of magnitude faster than the speed limit. right? So rather than melting from the outside in, it was literally melting from the inside out. There was so much energy that the energy required to put all the atoms in a, in a liquid state um, happened everywhere almost at once. Now, why is that important? This is a, really a stretch because I, I, I would say this is one of these beautiful stories of basic science leading to an application you wouldn't have anticipated. Up until now, you, people could not use laser for surgery. They use it for laser surgery, but you get burning. So it's only with laser for eye surgery where you don't want permanent healing, you can use it. If you think of what happens when you cut with a laser, you have to go solid, liquid, gas, and out. Think about a boiling pot of water. You know how you see the nucleation sites grow, 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 and then violently collapse? When they cut with a laser, that's what's happening, right? And so in the 80s, they killed a lot of people. And until now, they, for over 50 years, you couldn't use a laser to do surgery. This shows you can arrest the nucleation sites at one nanometer. There is no cavitation, right? And so what we can now do is um, we can now not do this, the burning. And this is what, what I'll show you. This is, so we developed the laser to excite to, we made of water. We used the information of how fast the phase transition can be driven to arrest nucleation growth. And I knew when we developed this laser, it wouldn't do this. Here's our laser tuned to wa the water window in a picosecond, not femtosecond time scale. First thing to notice, no smoke. When we developed the laser, I knew this would work. I had no idea how good it was going to work. I knew this is the fundamental limit for surgery with a laser, that we, this would be the least perturbative. The big surprise was that you now can cut with no scar tissue formation. And the Sick Kids is one of the world centers for um, health research. We, the pathologist, 80 milliwatts, by the way, is just 20 times this laser pointer. And you see just melting away the skin, right? Um, so they, could, they didn't even believe we did the surgery. They could find no scar tissue. So we actually had to put fiducials and burn the mouse skin so they could find it. What I'm showing you is we're milling. We, we stained the top cell. The absorption of water at the OH stretch is so strong, all the energy is focused into a single cell. 
So we now can do surgery at a single cell level. People who are deaf, we can now put microcochlea in and, and recover their hearing if the nerve's still alive. Vocal cord surgery is happening next year. There's some experimental studies going on, and we're going to be doing reconstructive surgery for burn victims. Um, you can imagine if you don't have scar tissue, you, at least in mice, right now we can make beautiful mice, right? I mean, this is important for plastic surgery, but, but the hope is it works for humans as well, and we have to do some pig models, which apparently are the closest model to us. Okay, so I know my time is up, I and mean, I didn't get to show you the movie, but I'm just going to skip, if I can just get two more, three more minutes. Two. Okay, so this is the first movie, and this is real data, sign transfer in real space, I can explain it. But those are the grainy pictures. Now let me just zip to, you know, that's 2003. Let me zip to 2010, uh, sorry, 13, what year are we? <laughs> uh, and so this, this is now coming out. Um, okay, somehow, oh yeah, so this is the new camera we've developed. So this is the camera. It's an RF pulse compression system that uses this, explicitly exploits the space-time correlation of the electron and refocuses. This is 10 to the 6 electrons, 30 femtoseconds. When you take into account the electron scattering cross-section, this is the same signal as you would get with a third, with a fourth generation billion dollar machine, and it would fit on this tabletop. Okay. So this is the new movie. So you're the first to see this. This is a material which is an organic superconductor. When you excite this system with light, you can move an electron from here to here. And what happens is the molecule kind of flattens, and that increases the overlap of the orbitals for the chemists. And you get an elect it looks like an, a lightning bolt. You get like you becomes metallic, right? So this is the system we did. This came from the Japanese. They were very strongly pushing organic superconductors, but there's a chemical reaction, and there's an optically induced charge transfer. This is what the crystal looked like with our old machine. It's a really electrons really. You need extremely thin samples. The samples are 100 nanometers thin. My group is expert at making nanoscale samples, right? So that's what it looks like. And here's what you saw in our old machine. You can see the differences statically by cycling the temperature. Here's our, our gun. This is with before and after. This diffraction, you see a spot right there? That's up to 0.2 inverse angstroms. The LCLS, the big machine, if they get up to one angstrom, they have a party. This little machine goes to 0.1. The new machines in, in Hamburg are going out to the second order diffraction. So the spatial resolution is remarkable. And if you look at the number of diffraction orders we have to solve now, we have hundreds of diffraction orders and can now reconstruct the motions at the atomic level. This is the static. This is what it looks like after the light's on. You can see it marching towards. This is the signal from just two diffraction orders, just to give you a feel for the signal to noise. Right? Normally at these big machines, the signal's jumping all over the place. And I'll just show you what it looks like. This is real data streaming to you. Watch. It's, this is the dream I had, and we've done it. I mean, this is just, we have hundreds of diffraction orders with that kind of signal noise that you can then go into a mathematical relationship to solve for the atomic motions. And now here's the movie. Oh, sorry. OK, now I have to shut up. <laughs> so my students heard this magic of chemistry, right? And um, one of my students took and solved all the modes of the, mo of the molecule. You did a Monte Carlo routine and kicked them all and did a differential analysis to, to get the best fit. And he found he could reconstruct all the atomic positions to the signal noise limit by simply three different modes. The phosphate counter ion, when the charge moves into here, there's a change in electric field. The PF6 minus feels the force, and it's the slow mode. It moves, and then all the other modes renormalize. We didn't expect it. There's the bending mode, and then there's a the sliding mode. And so you can take all this enormous amount of possibilities and it collapses to three coordinates and it looks like shadows. It looks like I'm doing a puppet show, right? I'm, I'm getting the same projections on three, what should be nominally independent degrees of freedom. What that means is the slow mode's moving, all the other atoms are renormalizing, right? And so we didn't know how to, we know how to think about equilibrium fluctuations. What we didn't know how to think about are the not far from equilibrium fluctuations and that's the new thing. And so here's the movie, I promised, <laughs> right? So again, don't tell anybody. <laughs> so you're going to have to watch this is very fast when it goes. So, so we're using structural refinement to get this. Here's the flattening mode. This is the one you expect. 
This is the counter eye in motion, so that's the other coordinate. And then there's a sliding mode. And so all the possible configurations, we can reduce it to three. Now watch, you get to watch, there's a very fast inertial kick. I have to get him to slow this down. <laughs> there it was. That was that first big shock to the charge displacement, and then it wiggles and jiggles to its final configuration. Okay. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I know. <laughs> uh, don't let me talk too much, I know. Okay, so we've done that. That's in press, that's under embargo. Um, I could show you some movies we can now, we've actually solved the solution phase things. I could show you for people who want to talk to me after about it. Um, we've got a new relativistic electron gun that got me to Hamburg. So this is a relativistic electron gun for atomic exploration. This is now pushing to 10 to the 7 electrons, 10 femtosecond time resolution, which means we'll be able to see the fastest atomic motions in nature. It looks like this. It would fit in this room quite comfortably. Okay, Dwayne. Uh, I this, think this you, you nope. should you this should let one? the people ask some okay. questions as well. So okay. let's thank Dwayne at this point. <laughs> Okay. So I'm sure after this exciting talk, there are many questions. No. No. <laughs> <laughs> you, you've impressed people too much. There's one. Well, we've heard about how um, when cyanobacteria began producing oxygen, it was poisonous to life. And somehow, as you point out, we learned to entrain it with the hemoglobin. Does looking at this from the quantum perspective rather than the classical give anybody any hints about uh, uh, different pathways of uh, evolutionary biology, how we evolutionarily develop this? Um, yes, I mean, that, that, the, the, the quantum mechanics is in the actual, that critical points where you have constructive and destructive interference that is happening, that's the quantum aspect. And the, th the fluctuations, you could say, are, are more classical, but even those are quantum. And so it, it, you have to kind of pull together the picture of if you look, what's kind of interesting, if you, if you look inside of us are these things called G-coupled receptors, right? 60% of the drug targets are towards these G-coupled receptors. They don't give structure. They don't give crystals. We don't know what the structure is specifically. And so um, the billion dollars that was spent on the x files was to crack that problem. We need a, a structural basis of G-coupled receptors. Getting back to your question, the few that we have look like, dino, like the early dinosaurs of bacteriodops and these seven transmember helices. So nature conserved that, that moiety and reprogrammed it to do all kinds of signaling between cells. And so this is the other thing I said, this will affect your lives. The x files are gearing up to be able to look at structures of these G-coupled receptors, which we just don't have. And I think we can do the same thing with electrons. And so. In the end, once the topology basis is developed, then you'll start to see the evolutionary pathway of how this, how biology was able to find tricks to direct chemistry in ways to do new functions. But from a quantum mechanical perspective, that's gonna be a little bit more, more tricky. What we had to do, and I didn't go through it, we do what's called a, a quantum, it's an ab initio MM molecular mechanics calculation. So we treat, we have to take that big molecule and cut a, a little small section of it and that we treat with, um, with ab initial theory, like pure quantum mechanic treatment of that, those motions. And then we have to bring them back because that's what dissipates and locks it into, gets you from my left hand to my right hand. And so there is a quantum aspect, but these are, the, maybe a quantum computer will help do those. In fact, that's one of the hopes, actually. <laughs> I mean, so the computations are really too heavy to do it quantum mechanically. So you, you cheat and you use, you use your best guess of what the important elements are and then you put a classical bath around it and use uh, molecular dynamics. There was another question in the back. Uh, I'm wondering, uh, on the bra uh, talking of topology, uh, with the individual molecules, uh, is there any um, thought about them being part of a larger structure, maybe one of the platonic solids, that then might, by some incremental simple set of one or two step uh, rules uh, cause some of these uh, different charge, uh, you know, uh, interactions to take place. Yeah, so um, what we, so it's interesting. So how did nature figure out how to couple reaction coordinates to breathe life into matter, right? So it has to be something simple, one could say profound, but I like simple. 
And so out of accident, what we did is I didn't talk about it, but we have another molecule we've studied, which is a diural ethene. It undergoes a ring closing reaction. And what we discovered, it was we, what we do is we excite and we cause the ring to close and then we use red light and reopen it. We cycle it to make our movie. And what we found is when, one, when you excite at a certain level where one molecule here has a chance of having another molecule right next to it excited, it changes the dynamics. It actually, the barrier, so when one molecule reacts, there's actually a volume change. And so that affects the barrier for fluctuations in the adjacent neighbor. And we saw that under, you know, what a single kiss can, uh, can single crystal conditions. And so if you think about what biology did is all those structural elements are crammed into a cell. They're really in close contact. And so as a lower zero order, when a molecule of protein undergoes a reaction, it changes shape. That shape change actually transmits forces to the next molecule. It communicates and it controls the neighbor. And the big thing to try to connect biology and chemistry together is something called proteomics and genomics. Um, okay, now I'm getting a little long-winded here, but um, with the human genome, I, I consider to be a bust because <laughs> uh, we, we thought we were two million, protein, two million genes and one, one gene, one protein. Uh, the discovery was that we only have 20,000 genes. And that's really great, I, I think, except the flatworm, flatworm has 7,000 genes, right? And we'd like to think we're a lot more complicated than a flatworm. And, and so the, the new challenge is we now know that these communication pathways involve networks. And so one thing undergoing a reaction here cascades nonlinear to another pathway. And now you have a really interesting problem. So you have something that's working at the fundamental noise limit, but behaving deterministically, and it has this nonlinear gain built into it. So there's a whole new field developing, but we need structural information to help guide how this process and communication happens. Hey, um, thanks for your talk. Um, there was one connection I wasn't too clear on, and that was when you talked about the medical lasers. Yeah. Um, what is there? Could you expand on what yeah, property of that yeah, allows so it to just cut without burning? Is it is it the time of it? Or? Yeah. So so what? Uh, I, I, for people interested, I can show you a whole bunch of movies like cornea being removed and things like that. So what people thought you had to have a long pulse to avoid shock waves, right? So. When I, in the 1980s, I was involved trying to solve this problem because people were being seriously injured. You can make fantastic cuts with the laser. They look great, especially eczema, but people were dying. They had cells many millimeters away were being sheared. Right? And so what happens is you take a long pulse, you deposit the energy, this material gets above the phase transition, and then will undergo evaporation and will leave. But you get, you get nucleation, gas bubbles grow, and then violently collapse during shock waves. Those propagate out and cause massive damage. But even before that, you're not in the really, in some way, the worst case, worst problem is you have heat transfer, the surrounding tissue. When you saw the burning with conventional laser, you get heat transferred laterally. It doesn't get above the temperature to ablate, but it burns. And when you watch surgeons, I saw them do a surgery on a person with uh, throat cancer, and uh, they, didn't do, they didn't put him in a medically induced coma for four days because of the, the traumatic damage they caused and, and just really have horrific outcomes in healing. So it's really only in the eye where you have no critical vascular, vasculature. They come up with an eczema laser and they can kind of zip around and change the index and, and that, right? So the way we did this is we, we're made of water. The boiling point of water is 100 degrees. The combustion point's 400 for tissue, right? So already you're a good, good partnership. You're in a good space. But the real key is you need to avoid the, sh the the acoustic, the growth of the bubbles and violent explosions that cause the shearing. And so by coming on picosecond, so these are picosecond infrared pulses. They're tuned to the OH stretch. And there's a paper in Nature in 2005 from my group. We, just, we were the first to, just, to actually look at pure water because you have to get it very, very thin, 400 nanometers thin. And we looked at the OH stretch. And we found because of special properties of water, that energy goes immediately at the fundamental limit into translation. So you think about cutting. Material has to come out. You have to convert. You have to transduce energy from absorbed energy into motion, right? So you have to transduce it into translational motion. Water will take an OH stretch and through the hydrogen bond directly couple into translations 100 times faster than any other material. Even a plasma takes a lot of time for the electrons to cool and couple to phonons. So this is 100 times faster. So basically, what we did, we tricked the system. 
We developed the laser to have a pulse that's shorter than the, the whole physics of the ablation process. No nucleation growth, and you basically, that, we use the water as a propellant. It, gets, it really gets hot. The whole process drives molecules into the gas phase. The whole process is faster. This was the, another surprise. The whole process is faster than the hot waters colliding with the proteins and getting them hot. So not only can we cut with no burning, cut the level of cell, we actually can smell what we're cutting at the molecular level. So surgeons are worried about cutting nerves. That's one of their big fears. We now know we get an intact, because we're not burning and, and destroying composition, we now can cut and detect if we get to a nerve or a critical blood vessel. And the other thing if we're, we're working on right now is imagine you have cancer. What they do now, they cut you open. They leave you open for three hours while they send a biopsy to pathology. We're pretty sure we can actually go into the laser and, use, and, 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 and sense the molecular, get a molecular fingerprint where there's good tissue. And we've already shown, what, I can show you, we've got some turkey tissue, we get a, actually, you get a, a okay, bio Okay, Dwayne, I would say, let's leave maybe the very details for the lunch break. And anyway. we have to... One or one or two more, one one or two more short questions, but the answers have to come from Gerald's table. You can answer yes or no. So, <laughs> yes. Um, hi, thank you very much for your talk. I really love your enthusiasm, um, <laughs> and I love the way that at least at the beginning of the talk, I really followed the uh, simple sort of models and things you were presenting. I kind of missed what was surprising about the final movie that you uh, showed. Could oh, you just oh, sort okay. of re, re, restate yeah, why that was surprising? Yeah, that, that's a good question. Because if you looked at the static structure, just like the, the heme doming, you would have thought it would just be the bending of the mole the, just the bending of those um, Edo molecules that increased the orbital overlap would have been the key motion, because that leads to orbital overlap and metallic behavior. That wasn't it. It was the slowest mode. So the secret to chemistry is it's the slowest inertial mode between the boundary between Brownian motion and inertial. And so the, the, the PF6 is a, is a very heavy atom. It sees the, the change in electric field. And as it's moving, all the other modes, the bending and the sliding mode are renormalizing around it. So it's dictating traffic. Otherwise, you wouldn't have seen, the, the other coordinates could have gone anywhere. They were actual sort of mirror images on all three coordinates. And the slow coordinate is that phosphate group. And that has a motion of about, uh, I think it was 250 femtoseconds for it to do this. And that's why when I showed you the movie, it went whoa. That was that inertial motion. Then it kicked something. Then there's a repulsive force. And the whole thing settled. And is that the thing that Well, for the heme problem, that would be the heme problem. That's the slow motion of these helical motions. For that problem, it's just the simple counter ions are, are governing the prop material properties. And so we're starting to see our first glimpse of, of how these low frequency inertial modes direct the, the traffic through reactions. Coordinate. OK, one final question here in the middle, which hopefully also has a short answer. I'll, I'll make do my it, best. I'll word it to make it a short answer. It'll almost be yes or no. Yes. <laughs> All right. Um, this isn't in the future, so it's a yes or no. <laughs> Do you see these results being able to be accomplished through interference waves? And this is my the reason I'm asking it. Right now, in order for you to cut, you have to have a direct application. You actually have to have the waveform hitting the object in order to, to cut. You're talking about the laser surgery then? I'm actually thinking more internal. You want to get rid of an aneurysm. I want to go into this person's brain, but I want to cut without cutting. Uh, people use things like, uh, there is ways to do that with things called gamma knives and protons. Absolutely. So they go I'm, in and then they, when they're absorbed, they kind of blast. I'm thinking we, the next we, step We can't do that. that. You have to actually have to physically remove material for what we're doing. But there okay. are other, other means with, with so-called gamma, gamma knives and proton knives. Thank you. Okay, let's close it at this and uh, thank Dwayne again for his nice talk. <laughs>